good morning. Are you with us today? Welcome to Life Church of Orange. The Lord's been waiting for us. He's been waiting for you. You know, it says in uh, Hebrew chapter 4, it talks about entering into God's rest. It talks about those that had the possibility, but they don't grab a hold of it. You know what God went and did in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7? It says, God created yet another day. God's brought forth yet another day for you to grab a hold of his rest. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, come. That's an invitation. He says, come to my rest. What is that rest? That rest is the peace of God that rests upon you. Are you struggling today? Stop. Are you restless today? Stop. Jesus says, I'll give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. You won't figure it out, but you'll know it when God put that rest on you. Today, God has created and yet another day for you to grab hold of what he has for you today. Lord, we give you praise today. We are here to worship you and you alone, God. Father, we enter into your rest and trust in your peace. We trust in your promises. We trust in your word. We trust in you, Lord. We give it all to you today, and we rejoice in the Lord. Everybody just rejoice in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all ready to worship the Lord today? Amen. Come on, we worship him because he is holy. Our God he is holy, he is great, seated above all, always the same, comforts are broken, heals their disease, yeah, he is an awesome God, come on sing that again, he is an awesome God, my heart exalts in the Lord, I lift him high, I sing because of the one who died and set my soul on fire. There's no one, no one like our God. He's holy, worthy of our praise. Great is his love, great is his love, great is his love for me. He breaks the power of enemies. Saves us from evil, his love redeems, keeps his promise, his word is true, yeah. He is an awesome God, he is an awesome God, my heart exalts in the Lord, I lift him high, I sing because of the one who died, set my soul on fire, his Our God, He's holy, worthy of our praise. Great is His love, great is His love, great is His love for me. There's no one, no one like our God. He's holy, worthy of our praise. Great is His love. Great is His love for you and me. Great is His love. Great is His love. Great is His love for me. God is holy, yeah, worthy, worthy of our praise. Great is His love, great is His love, great is His 
love for you and me. Great is his love, great is his love, great is his love for me. Come on, his love is great, amen. He is holy. He's the king. He is the king of all kings, Lord of all lords. Yeah. You know, when God was dealing with Pharaoh, God led Moses to go through Pharaoh, even though it seemed like the enemy. <laughs> but God led him to go that way. And after each attempt that they thought for freedom, another plague comes, right? And they're thinking, we're going to be free this time. Another plague comes, and another, and another. And the people get discouraged, right? Kind of sounds like today. Well, things just keep seeming to get worse for Moses and for us. But God said, I will bring you out. God said, I will free you. God said, I will redeem you. God said, I will take you as my own. And God said, I will be your God. Come on, can we praise him for that? We thank you, Lord. We bless you, God. Hallelujah. Let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. Sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. Sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Come on. Let it rise. Sounds like we praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. 
love's like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you Come on, get loud This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall shout to the Lord because the Bible says so right that's biblical worship we shout to the Lord because the Bible says give the Lord a shout shout unto the Lord with a loud voice thank you God bless you Lord. let's just worship him now thank you Jesus you know the beginning of this song it says old things have passed away but his love has stayed the same Let's just release anything that you might have right now in your heart. Just release it to him right now. Those things are past. But his love for you remains the same. Thank you, God.
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, Our hearts will cry these bones. 
Church, why do we why do we sing that we love God? Because the word of God tells us that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. That leaves no other place that God doesn't have. When we love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, that's for us, that's us saying, Lord, we love you with everything. 
Lord, that we put you first and foremost. Lord, we say that you have it all. It means that we love you with all our mind. All of our processes, our moralities, our thinking. Lord God, we love you with everything in us, Lord God. There's nothing that we hold back. Lord, we love you with our emotions. Nothing is held in reserve for us. Everything is given to you first. And God, most importantly, we love you because you first loved us. We are not capable of loving you on our own, Lord God. It's your mercy. It's your mercy that you sent your son, Jesus. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this place. God, where we can be wide open with you. We can be transparent, Lord God, because there's no hiding from you. But Lord, we can respond. We can respond to your presence. We can respond to your goodness, to your mercy by lifting our hands. Regardless of the people around us, and just worship you. And just have an honest moment with you, Lord God. To have an honest, tender moment before you, living God. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you, Lord God, that you're so good. That you see beyond our frailties. You see beyond our weaknesses. Jesus, that you said before the Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Lord, that was all of us. Your great love for us, God, that we can be in this place. That we can say that we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you've done such wonderful things to us and for us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, as your word says in Romans 6, 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what we have. We have newness of life in you, Lord God. This, in, this, in your presence, in your love, Lord God, this is life. We are alive in you, Jesus. We're alive because of you, Lord God. You have made us alive. Your resurrection power, the Spirit of God in us. Your presence with us always, Lord. God, we thank you. Thank you that we can honor you and love you in return, just as you've loved us. And all of this we ask in your name, Jesus. Church, if you agree, say amen. Amen. Bless the Lord this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Well, you may be seated. Welcome this morning in God's house, God's presence and in the presence of your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all glad you're here. Amen, amen. It's going to be a good day. Great worship, Becky. Worship team, thank you so much. God bless you all. Man, I was ready this morning, right? Started with that song. What's it called? No, what's it called? Song? No one. I'll say it all wrong. I'll be like, nobody. You know that song, Nobody. I like that song, Nobody. No, no one. Man, that was, that was good. I was ready. It was like just the engines got pumping with that one, so praise God. Now, that's, Jordan, that's your song, right? You wrote that? Yeah, so praise God. 
Oh, he's got a few. He's got a few. Right, he's got a few of them. So, you know, the Lord's going to put some good things together not too, not too long from now. So be ready. When Jordan's ready to announce the news, there'll be some good, good news to share. So, amen. Hey, uh, I'm late to the party in this one. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Hey, Mother's Day. Praise God. Everybody's got a mama. Thank you, Lord. And so um, we're going to have a raffle next Sunday. So we've got a, um, how would you describe it? We've got a, like a, a f- thank you. That was the word I was looking for, an arrangement, a flower arrangement. So we're going to raffle that off Sunday, Mother's Day. So uh, that means children, sons and daughters. That's a great time to, you know, uh, engage in the raffle there and uh, win something for your mom. And obviously the proceeds go to the church. So praise God for that. Um, So that's going to happen next Sunday. I should have announced something sooner. So I apologize for that. But um, so so just to let you know, we're going to be doing that next Sunday after church. And uh, so we'll be having raffle tickets for you to buy and uh, you'll get to see the it'll be out on display for you. So it's going to be it's beautiful and uh, we'll have all that going. Uh, Speaking of Jordan Yarbrough, Jordan Yarbrough has an announcement. Would you welcome again Jordan Yarbrough? How's it going, everybody? It's awesome to be here today. Amen. So for those of you who don't know, we shot a music video last week here. And those of you who do know... How much fun was it? So much fun, right? We had a blast. And uh, I want to show you a quick snippet. A lot of you have been asking me how it went and things like that. So, hey, Dad, if you would roll the video whenever you're ready. Um, yeah, it was so much fun. You'll, you'll probably see that in the video. Here it is. Oh. Uh-oh. There we go. All right, that's good. Awesome. So I don't want to show it all to you because in a couple of weeks when it's done, I'm going to show it to you again. <laughs> so we had a, a ton of fun. Thank you, everybody who was a part of it. Honestly, it was, it was, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. So um, as you saw there, uh, we put a couple of those letters that I've been asking you guys about in the video. Those were Maddie's. They turned out so great. Um, Pam Johnson also made a whole banner uh, this week, and it looks so good. So I would love if after service, if we could actually line up out here right in the back behind the stage. Well, not behind the stage. There's nothing back there. It's the parking lot. If we go out to the parking lot, we'll take a photo with the banner um, with everybody um, behind it. It would be awesome. And then we'll throw that in the video and it's, it's going to be like a whole family event, right? So that, that's what this is all about. So um, we're going to do that. And then if you did bring any more letters, um, I'm going to also be shooting um, each of just random people with their letters in front of them. Um, and we're going to throw those in the videos and things in the video as well. And uh, it's going to turn out great. So I'm really excited. Um, and then we'll get this on YouTube and to the rest of the world, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, Jordan. So exciting. So exciting. It's fun, 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 fun. All right. So that'll, we'll do that after the service today. So and we'll make sure Jordan uh, connects with everybody to, to remind everybody to come on out there. So Praise God. Hey, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings at this time. Hey, amen. Amen. Still, praise God. Still part of worship. Giving is still worship. It's, how, it's part of our, our, our worship to the Lord. I want to read to you here from Hebrews eleven six. 6. 
and understand this. Giving is faith, but it's also, giving is also believing that God is a rewarder. You know, it's one thing to come when it, when it comes to giving that, okay, I'm trusting in the Lord, I'm, I'm doing this by faith. But the Word of God tells us that God is a rewarder. And many times, that might be difficult to believe that God would reward, that, that God is a rewarder, maybe because of experiences, maybe because of circumstance, maybe because of our own failings. You know, we might have this perception. But the Word of God says this. You know, faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by the Word of God. But 11.6, Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. So first, to believe God, to have faith, you must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So not only in our giving, but in all points of faith, when we understand that God rewards not because we deserve it or because we did something worthy of reward, but because we believe. And to believe is to obey. And he loves us. And as a good father, he enjoys rewarding his obedient children. Does not John 3.36 say this? And I'm going to read out the New Living Translation. It says, and anyone who believes, this is Jesus saying this, anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. And then he says, anyone who does, does not obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Now, Understand what Jesus is trying to tell us here is that it, to believe is to obey. When you believe God, then you're going to obey what his word says. And so when you hear a scripture, when you, when you hear scriptures like Hebrews eleven six, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, then it's for our hearts to say yes and amen. It's for our hearts to say, Lord, I believe your word and I agree. So faith in giving means that you first believe that God is, meaning that God is with you. If you believe that God is, then you believe as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, what you're saying is you believe that God is with you. You believe that he's right there by your side. You believe that he's with you, but you believe that he is indeed for you. And interestingly, related to our possessions and our ability to give, Hebrews 13.5 teaches us this. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, that's Jesus. That, that's the Lord saying that. And two interesting things to consider about this. One, covetousness, or better understood greed, is idolatry, according to Colossians 3.5. Greed will never express love, and because it is idolatry, what it does is greed will hinder our ability to worship the Lord. And it keeps people out of the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6.10 tells us this. But secondly, in response to this, the scripture is telling us that Jesus stresses to us, he stresses to you here today, that he will himself will never, ever, ever forsake you. Now somebody needs to hear that today. We need to be reminded that this is the promise in God's word, that this is what he is saying to all of us who believe. If you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a follower of Christ. That's what a Christian means. It means you're a follower of Christ. So what he is saying to you as a child of God, as a follower of Christ, he says that he will never, ever, ever forsake you. It's the same. And see right there, right there. You may hear that and you may say, oh, but I have failed. I don't deserve Jesus to do that for me. You may, some condemnation may come upon you at that moment. And inside you, you start to try to reject that. But see, this is where we have to let the truth of God's word supersede everything else and listen to what the word of God says. And it's the same way that Jesus says that he gives us eternal life. And that we will never perish. And he says that no one can snatch us out of his hand in John 28. 
So we can be secure in that. We can be secure in knowing that no one will ever take us away from the living God. The good shepherd, he says, he lays down his life for the sheep. Amen? Amen. So according to what we're seeing here in Hebrews 11.6, going back to Hebrews 11.6, faith works when we believe that God's presence is with us always, even though we cannot see him. We believe that he is. We believe that he's with us. And in his love, his agape, his unconditional love for us, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That he says, I'm going to reward you because you seek me, because you believe me. Didn't Jesus say when he returns, will he truly find faith in the earth? That's what God's looking for, right? He's looking for you to believe that he is meaning that he's with you, that he's with you always, that he never departs, he never abandons you, right? We think that when we go through the trials of life, we say, God, where are you? But many times that's the Lord saying, I'm right here with you. Now trust me in this. Trust me in this that I'm going to make a way for you. Trust me in this that I'm going to turn this around for your good. Trust me in this that it's all going to go according to my will. And trust him even during the storm that he is going to be the one that's going to calm the raging waters and the winds around us. Amen. So, so when our faith weakens, it's because we've forgotten or taken our eyes or our thoughts off of God. We doubt that he is with us or that he loves us at his children, as his children. Indeed, he is our heavenly father. If you call upon the name of Christ, he takes care of what's his. Amen? So in our giving, let us trust him and let us know that he's providing for us because he's a good father and he looks out for us. But let us believe that he is and let us believe that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, that you are a good father. You're a perfect father, our heavenly father, and you provide all our needs. Lord God, thank you that you uh, say that you send the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Lord God, you're merciful. Lord God, even in our failings, Lord God, do you show your goodness? Lord God, but thank you that as your children, as your sons and daughters, Lord God, as we hear your word and we obey your word, Lord God, we see your goodness to even greater degrees. Thank you that you provide our needs. Thank you that you, you tell us to ask, Lord God, and that you will provide. Father, I thank you that we come and we see from your word, Lord God, that we believe that you are with us always, you never forsake us, and that you reward those who diligently seek you. And we trust you. In Jesus' name, and church, if you agree, say amen, amen, amen. So here in God's house, um, we have a, our, our giving box there in the back. If you're making out a check, make it out to Life Church of Orange, and uh, you can place it back there. If you are watching this online uh, as we're streaming here, uh, you can go to our website, lifeoc.org, and at the right uh, hand, there's a tab there where you can uh, uh, give online. And uh, also we have a, a mobile app. It's called the Church Center app. You can uh, download, load that on your mobile phone, uh, and uh, you just find Life Church of Orange, California, and then uh, you put in your information. You can give there. And as well, uh, the old-fashioned way, snail mail, 3514 East Chapman Avenue, Orange, California, 92869 is our mailing address for those of you online, and uh, you can mail your giving there. So God bless you, church. We thank you. Thank you for your giving, your generosity, and uh, uh, the Lord is faithful, but God uses his faithful people uh, in, in giving. So we, we appreciate that, and we, we thank you. Thank you very much, church, for your generosity. And with that, uh, I am so excited today uh, with our guest. You know, I, I, mean, I want to say special guest, and you know, because I want to honor him. But, man, he's our brother, and uh, I, I love this man, and I love this woman. And, you know, if I could just ask, I know Sharon probably isn't going to want to do this, but can I get you both just to come up and just to both say hello? Would you welcome Pastor Ray and Sharon Ellis? If I can just get you to say hello to everybody and, and uh, just greet everybody. Just a quick moment, and then you can hand it off to, to Pastor Ray. Good morning. Well, we're really glad to be here. It's a blessing to be here and and uh, to see you all and meet new people. Amen. 
my, my wife's favorite thing to do. <laughs> Amen. Well, praise God. It is good to be back here with you at, at Life Church to see all these familiar faces. Some we met last time for the first time. Some old ones have come back, and we got a chance to have some fellowship with them. And it's just so good to be together with God's people in God's house, worshiping as we were designed to do. Amen. 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 So, <laughs> Amen. Well, praise God. Amen. You know, it's, it's always good to be together with God's people in, in God's house. That's just, that's just a remarkably wonderful thing. And uh, Pastor Gabe and I, I know I told you last time I was here, we had been talking about our getting together, ministering together since uh, before we had actually left to go to Idaho. And so and when it finally came back time for us to get together, it was like, okay, I retired from the police department and now I have some time in my schedule and things just start to work out. And so we had the opportunity to come down last year and minister with you guys and, and meet your faces and, and, and all those wonderful things. And if you remember the last time I told you that as uh, I was preparing to minister, I kept seeking the Lord for what his will would be for the congregation. Because I believe that every word has a right now time. And so I began to seek the Lord for that word. And I got nothing, if you remember. And uh, I was getting worried. Yeah, because it was like the night before. And I'm still like, Lord, you know, you need to tell me something. And then finally, God gave me the word to that, uh, that I brought to you last time. However, this time was a little different. This time was a little different. Uh, from the moment I, I told Gabe that I had a word that, uh, that we would come, I felt the word of the Lord drop into my spirit. And I'm not sure which experience is better, because now I had more time to think about it and wonder if it's right. <laughs> Whereas before, I didn't have time to wonder. I was just getting to go do it because it was like game time. Uh, but last night, as I was praying again for the service, uh, the Lord spoke to my heart, and I'm just going to share something, particularly for you, Sister Big. Yeah, uh, something the Lord put in my spirit last night. Now, I, I, I always hate doing this. I'd rather when people give me little hints. Uh, so I don't, I'm just going to share what was in my heart, and then you can tell me how wrong I was later, okay? And if it was right, it was God. If it was wrong, it was Pastor Sharon. Um, <laughs> but as I was praying, as clear as day, I saw an image of you walking and I'll tell you how you were dressed. You had on a pair of shorts that came to like right here, and they were kind of that tannish military green. And you had on a dark blue tank top, white strap tank top. And you were walking in just sand, like a desert. And I kept wondering, thinking, why is she wearing sandals or flip flops? That's going to be hard to walk in that sand. And you had a cup in your hand, and it was an, dis distinctly an earthen vessel, it was clay like a little mug, a little larger than a coffee cup. But the bottom corner out of it was broken. There was nothing there. And I knew as I was watching that you were looking for water. And I was thinking that sand is hard. The sun is hot, and she has a broken cup. How is this going to work? And right in the middle of this desert was a stream. And the stream was crystal clear. And you got to the side of the stream, and you knelt down, and you put your cup in, and when you came up, the cup was whole. And then out of that was this refreshing that came. And so that was the vision that I said, okay, Lord, I'll just live the word to her and let her deal with that. But I don't know what that means or if it means anything to you, but I saw that it was just a total time of restoration with refreshing that was coming from the Lord. So uh, we can talk afterwards. Amen. Amen. Uh, but today, uh, as I said, when the Lord put this in my heart to come to you, he gave me a topic, which is, I find ironic, coming to Life Church, because one thing I love about Life Church is your spirit of worship. I love the spirit of worship. And the Lord dropped this word in my heart, uh, come, let us worship. So today we're going to talk about worship. Uh, as a preamble to that, I want you to open your Bibles quickly to the fifth chapter of Ephesians. We're going to read a verse here, and then we're going to get started. Uh, I want you to think about worship in the context of marriage. I want you to think about worship in the context of marriage. 
Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. Let's read that together. Paul, talking about the institution of marriage, says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Let's pray over the word. Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, yes, a, a flawed and broken vessel, but I come, Lord, not in my own strength or power, but Lord, I come in, in the power and the name of Christ Jesus. And Lord, it's your word that brings life, and we pray that you anoint our time here together, that you would touch hearts, Lord God, you would restore lives, you, you would establish paths and direction, Lord God, you would encourage your people to stand, and that, Lord, that in standing, we'll be able to resist all the fiery darts of the enemy and bring glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So when we think about this concept, again, of worship and, and, and marriage, and this, this idea of intimacy, of establishing and creating intimacy between spouses, this, this highest form of communication of love, this highest form of communication of self, where we're totally giving ourselves over to another person, this idea of there is a, a, a sense of nakedness, there's no barriers, there is no hiding, there is, there's, there's nothing there, there's no pretense or facade, there is just this giving of oneself, this surrender of oneself. And when we come into worship, this is what the Lord requires of us, that when we come into his presence, there is to be the removing of all the trappings of the world, all the trappings of the day, all the trappings even of my own self. I just want to come before God and say, Lord, here I am, and I want to present myself to him in that way. So when we think about worship, what I want to challenge you with this morning is to think of it in the context, one, of yourself with God, and then two, in the context of the world that we live in. Because the world is, is if in the state that we're in, in the situations that are going on nationally, politically, socially, morally, uh, the world's in a state where it needs to see a demonstration of the true and living God. It needs to see God practically demonstrated in the lives of his people. Uh, the time has gone when we can throw up a facade, throw up a banner and say, okay, we're worshiping, singing, and then the, the world goes, okay, that's the church. Right now, the world is even becoming uh, antagonistic to the church. They're not tolerating the church. Uh, the, for the first time in my life, I saw the, the government tell the church what it can and cannot do, what it should or should not do. And I began to see the world be encroaching into the church but in that darkness that the world brings that 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 that, that sense of wanting to overcome the church there is death there is death in that striving for life in the world what they actually gain a hold of is death and the only answer to that is Jesus Christ it's the only answer to that is Jesus Christ so as we as his people began to truly worship him and I'm not talking about singing songs. Yeah. I'm not talking about singing songs, but as we truly begin to worship him, the Bible promises us that God inhabits the praises of his people. So when we really are praising him, when we really are giving him ourselves, God is in that moment. And when God is in that moment, that's when the power of God is available to touch the lives of the people around us. Uh, go quickly, please, to uh, Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, here in the passage where the Spirit of God is speaking through the prophet, and he begins to give a glimpse of the future to Daniel, but he's also speaking to us of what's going on in our day and time. We're going to start reading in verse 29. Daniel 11, starting in verse 29. It says, at the right time, the northern king will attack the southern king again, but this time he will not be successful as he was before. Ships from Cyprus will come and fight against the northern king. He will see those ships coming and be afraid. Then he will turn back and take out his anger on the holy agreement. He will turn back and help those who stopped following the holy agreement. The northern king will send his army to do terrible things to the temple in Jerusalem. They will stop the people from offering the daily sacrifices. Then they will do something really terrible. They will set up the terrible thing that causes destruction. The northern king will use lies and smooth talking to trick those who quit following the holy agreement, so they will sin even worse. But those who know God and obey him will be strong, and they will fight back. And this is the time in which we are living, saints. The kings of this earth are posturing. 
The kings of this earth are posturing. They're, they're, they're fighting for territory. And in doing so, they want to suppress the worship of the true and living God. And they will even use smooth talk and smooth conversation to draw the people of God into agreement with them. And so doing, wanting to establish a throne of Satan, even in the hearts of God's people. But see, those who know their God, and that's where we come back to worship. Those who know their God. Those who have that true intimacy with their God. Those who are walking in right relationship with their God. Those who are able to hear and know his voice, to discern his voice from the voice of another. Those who, who follow after him. They who know their God will do exploits, not because they are so good and so powerful. See, understand, this is not about you. This is not about you being the man. This is about God in you. And so when you know God and you're walking with God, then that is where the power of God is released in your life. And it's released almost automatically. It's not something you have to put on. It is something you are. You're walking in that right relationship with God. Now, go back again to, to the New Testament. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to build a platform because we're going to bring our text out of Deuteronomy. But I'm just building a platform now because I want to have an establishment to, to give you the thoughts I feel the Lord has put in my heart. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read verses 19 through 22. Now, we're going to tie this back to this context. We need to keep everything lined up together. First of all, that this worship is representing or talking about intimacy, having true intimacy with God, that Christ in the church type intimacy, that same type of intimacy that is represented by a, a good and godly marriage. We're talking about having that level of intimacy with God. And at the same time, we're looking at that in the context of the world in which we live. Because it doesn't do us any good, y'all, if, if it's only happening inside this room. It's got to be real outside in the context of the world in which we live. And so now we're going to add to that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 22. And the writer says, and so brothers and sisters, we are completely free to enter the most holy place. Now, you have to understand this first. You're completely free to enter into the most holy place. See, sometimes to our Gentile mind, that doesn't mean anything. It just blows right over our head. But you have to understand that, that as, especially as a Gentile, you couldn't go into the most holy place. If you weren't the high priest, you weren't going into the most holy place. So now he says something has changed. There's a situation in, 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 in history, there's a situation in life that has changed, that has is, is changed the way the game is played. Now we don't have to stand out here in the outer court. We don't have to come into the court of the Gentiles. I can go all the way inside to the most holy place. And what do we find in the most holy place? The presence of our God. See, now we're coming back to worship. We're coming back to worship. In that most holy place, he says, we can do this without fear because of the blood sacrifice of Jesus. We enter through a new way that Jesus opened for us. It is a living way that leads through the curtain of his flesh, Christ's body. And we have a great priest who rules the house of God. Sprinkled with the blood of Christ, our hearts have been made free from a guilty conscience. Now, somebody said this morning, I forget who it was that said it. We're talking about the freeing of our minds. You see, it's so important that we be even free from the string of, of, of guilt and sin in our conscience. You begin to remember your failings. You remember how you came up short, how it didn't work out. Things didn't go the way you thought they would, and your conscience begins to work against you. But you understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses even our consciousness from that sin. We have to put that on by faith. Brother, I could not agree with you more. It's, it's by faith. We put that on by faith and we accept it because Jesus said it's true. And because he said it, we can, we can walk on that. And we come in and he says, and even our bodies have been washed with pure water. And because of all that, because of all that that just happened, he, gives, he starts off this next sentence with a very powerful word. He says, so. So. In other words, because of all that, now you get to do this. See, because of all what Jesus has done, he says, so now come near. You see, the impetus again is where? It's, it's not on the Holy Spirit reaching out and grabbing you by your face and dragging you in. See, it's not about uh, someone behind you pushing you through the door. It's so now you come near. 
You decide to come near with a sincere heart, full of confidence because of your faith in Christ. So we're talking again about us surrendering ourselves to God. Now you come back to that image of worship we talked about before. I'm going to remove the barriers. I'm not going to hide behind the facades. I'm not going to hide behind my traditions. I'm not going to even hide behind my histories. I'm going to come naked, as it were, and say, God, here I am. I'm going to present myself to you. Now, when we talk about worship, that's one of those words like love. We throw it around a lot. We worship the time we have together. And, brother, I do. I worship the time we have together. We worship our sports teams. Well, not so much anymore. <laughs> we worship our ideas and our thoughts, and we even worship our own selves. But the worship we're talking about today, guys, is that worship that takes us outside of ourselves, that worship that connects us to the true and living God. And to understand that, we need to know, first of all, who he is and who we are in him. Now, we're going to take our text this morning and go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. I know sometimes I preach at home, they say, Pastor, your introduction lasts as, how, as long as your sermon sometimes. So, but I just want to give you a foundation for where we're trying to go this morning. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 12, we're going to go through this slowly, verses 1 through 10. Now, before we do this, let's further our context. Remember where this story began. It began in Genesis, right? God introduces himself to man. And as we go through Genesis, we have this introduction where there's like, if you imagine when you first met the love of your life, you, this person is introduced into your world. Adam comes into the sphere of God. And there is this exchange of knowing. And then we move a little further on, we get to Exodus, where God says to man, do you want to be mine? And you know, man says, yes, we'll be your people, you'll be our God. Then we move out of Exodus into Leviticus where the actual marriage takes place, the law is given, it's established, now they become bound. And then we go into number, Deuteronomy, we'll go to Numbers, I'm sorry, in Numbers there, now we begin to review that life, what does it mean to be coupled with God? And then we get finally into Deuteronomy, which is that second telling where we look back over those 40 years and say, okay, this is where you started, this is how you got to that second stage, this is where you wound up, Look at, look at where you are. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. So because we have to understand that we were called out of Egypt. Just like the nation of Israel, we were in Egypt. And we have to remember that in Egypt, Israel learned a whole lot of bad stuff. We like to think romantically sometimes about the, the people of God as if they, they walked uh, differently than you and I. And because we do that, we miss the lessons of life. And so they came out of Egypt, even though they were still the covenant people of God, even though they were still the children of Abraham, they came out of Egypt and they brought with them idol worship. They brought with them the customs of the world around them. They brought with them traditions that had nothing to do with God. And so when they came into God, having a relationship with God, he had to teach them everything about being his people. Now, here's a New Testament example. The book of Luke, we remember the, the disciples are hanging around Jesus and they watch Jesus pray. And they looked at themselves and they said, when he prays, it's not like when we pray. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Understand something as fundamental as that. They said, Lord, teach us to, because when we pray, it ain't like what you do. And the same principle applies here. They came into worship now. They came into this thing, this art of worship. And God had to say to them, okay, what you call worship is not what I call worship. So now I'm going to teach you now the prescribed way to do worship. And that's what we're going to look at today. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, these are the laws and the rules here it goes again, that you must obey in your new land. What is he talking about? You break this down to his rudimentary idea, right? The nation of Israel comes out of Egypt. God is now training them and teaching them through the course of the wilderness how to be his people. But they finally come to a place. There is a barrier. There is a, a fundamental line where they are going to leave the wilderness and enter into the promised land. This is where they are now. So God is saying to them right here, I want you to contrast 
the way you lived, the way you worshiped when you were in Egypt. I want you to contrast the way you worshiped when you were in the wilderness. I want you to contrast that against what you're going to be required to do once you cross over into Jordan. Because, see, Jordan doesn't represent heaven. Jordan represents spiritual maturity. Jordan represents growing up. Because now you're coming in the wilderness, you out there in that place, right? You're in that wilderness. You're going around and around in circles. But once you step across Jordan, you're coming into Israel. You're coming into that place that's governed by God. Now you're under the authority of God. Now God's going to make some, some very distinct demands about them on what and how worship is supposed to be. He says, you must carefully obey them as long as you live in this land. Reference, we're talking again about spiritual maturity. The Lord is the God of your ancestors, and he has given this land to you. Now, this is what we want you to understand. All those things you learned in Egypt about worship, all those habits you grabbed onto while you were in the wilderness, they're still there. They're still on you. They're still in you. That's why he says here, you will take that land from the nations you live in now. That means you have to go in and do war with your flesh. You see, there are seven kingdoms represented in the Holy Land that God said to the nation of Israel, you do not make covenant with them. When you cross over into the Holy Land, you will destroy them down to the last man and woman, down to the pigs that crawl through the street. You will kill everything. You do not make peace with them. And those represent the strongholds that are in your flesh. That represents the things you've learned and picked up. And those kind of things you have to destroy utterly. You have to come in before God and say, I'm going to take this land. This is my land. You've given it to me, but I'm going to possess it now. He says, you must completely destroy all the places where the people of these nations worship their God. See, we, we don't want you to stop and think about this just geographically. I don't want you to think about this historically. But I want you to think about this spiritually and internally. When you come into uh, to spiritual maturity... All those things, all those habits you have, God says you need to destroy the things that are of this world. You need to destroy them. He says you must completely destroy all the places where the people of these nations worship their God. The places are high. They take authority. They represent the high places. They're on hills. They're on the green trees. You must smash their altars and break their memorial stones into pieces. You must burn their ashes pole and cut down the statues of their God. Wipe out everything that would remind you of those gods. So we got to tear down before we can build up. So you must not, here's, here's verse four says, you must not worship the Lord your God in the same way these people worship their gods. You see, you just can't take it and stick a fish on it and call it godly. You hear what I'm saying? You just can't take it and stick a dove symbol on it and call it godly. See, the worship of the Lord is, is at its root. It's, it's, it's fundamentally different. And this is what God is trying to get the people of Israel and get us to understand that when you came out of Egypt, you have to let Egypt go. You can't bring Egypt forward and, and put a stamp on it and call it godly. You have to purge it, destroy it, crush it, burn it, cut it down. You need to do whatever it takes to get this out of you. And out of your act of worship, he says, you must not worship the Lord your God in the same way these people worship their gods. So there should be a fundamental difference. See, the Lord your God will choose a special place among your tribes that he, that, uh, I'm sorry, the Lord your God will choose a special place among your tribes that will be the home for his name. What we're talking about here is the dominion of God. So when we're worshiping, we want to worship into and under the dominion of God. Now, let's go back to Israel. We talked about being in Israel. Remember Jacob. He's on his way home. Remember the story? He, his brother's coming. He thinks his brother's going to kill him. So he's out. He's, he's waiting. He got Everybody's gone before him. Now, he's waiting. He's put all the women and the children in front because he's a big, brave man, right? <laughs> he's hanging out in the back. And lo and behold, the angel of the Lord shows up. And he begins to wrestle with this angel. The Bible says that his name was changed from Jacob to Israel because he struggled with the Lord. Now, this is what I want you to This is the beauty of it. You have to struggle with the Lord. Because this stuff we just got through talking about, it don't just go away. You got to struggle with the Lord. However, you have to lose. You have to struggle with the Lord, and then you have to lose. 
And you know what happens if you lose? It changes the way you walk. See, if you win, you come out and you maintain yourself. You go in, you come out the same way you went in. But in order to grow, in order to move on, you have to lose. You struggle with the Lord, but then you have to lose. And this is where Israel is. God is saying, now you come into this place of maturity. You need to struggle with me. And as a result of your struggling with me, your walk should be changed. Your worship needs to look altogether different. He says, you must go to that place and worship him. There you must bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifice, one-tenth of your crops and animals and your special gifts and the gifts you promised to him. Any special gift you want to give and the first animals born of your herds. So you and your families will eat together at that place and the Lord your God will be there with you. You will enjoy sharing those things you worked for there. You will remember that the Lord your God blessed you and gave you these good things. Now listen to what he says here. This next verse sets it apart. This next verse sets it all apart. He says, you must not continue to worship the way we have been worshiping. Stay with me. You must not continue to worship the way we have been worshiping. He says, until now, each of us has been worshiping God any way we want it. We've been determining how we're going to worship God. Now, God said that was okay because you had not yet entered into his rest. You had not entered into the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But this next, this last verse, he says, but you will go across Jordan. What do we say Jordan represents? Spiritual maturity. You will go across Jordan, and guess what? Now you no longer do it any way you want. Now I'm going to do it the way God said do it. Now, I'm going to worship God the way God said. Because when I'm in the desert, when you're in the wilderness, you're traveling. you got the tabernacle and you're traveling. And sometimes the tabernacle's up for a day and sometimes it's up for a year. And so you can't do all the things that you were required to do because you're moving through the wilderness. And you see, when you come out of, of Egypt, uh, for all of us, that wilderness is a very important place. See, we come out of Egypt and, we, and, and even though we were the children of God called out of, of Egypt, all we knew about life was Egypt. How many of you guys were born saved? Anybody? All you knew about life was Egypt. You heard about God. You heard that that was a promise over you, but when you looked up in the morning, you were still a slave. Pharaoh, the king of the world, was still in charge of you until one day somebody came and began to teach a different message. A different message began to ring and you start thinking about deliverance and you start remembering some of the things you had heard and then hope began to be burning your heart. But guess what? You were still in Egypt. But then you begin to desire to be not a slave anymore. You want to be free. You want to be owning of your own family. You want to have your own destiny at hand, but you were still in Egypt. And then one day. You see, the blood came, the blood was shed, and then the Passover happened, and the next morning, not, not three weeks later, but that next morning when the blood was shed, you were free. But guess what? You were still in Egypt. You see, you were free, but you were still in Egypt. You had to do something. You had to get out of Egypt. And so now we pack up our stuff and we start to get out of Egypt. We start to move out into the wilderness. And immediately, what do we find? Immediately, we find ourselves stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? We got a rock on the right side we can't climb. We got a rock on the left side and the Red Sea before us. And behind us is that old devil. You see, Egypt is still wanting to claim what it believes as being his own. And in this place, what happened? You remember the people of Israel, they began to cry out. We, got, we could have stayed in Egypt and died. You brought us out here. And God says, shut up. I got a plan. And then God worked his plan. And what did people begin to understand that, oh, we sing the song sometime that he's a way maker, miracle worker. Oh, we get the worship team back up here in a minute, won't we? <laughs> they begin to understand something about God. Oh, well, okay, wait. He's greater than my rocks and my hard place. And so they came through the Red Sea. They be, see, they're beginning now to understand one of the key uh, platforms for worship. See, they had this platform before, but they didn't know it. So God had to reveal it to them. And so they went through the Red Sea, and immediately on the other side of the Red Sea, they ran into the Amalekites. 
But see, coming up out of the Red Sea washed all the tools of war that they didn't have before. And now they have been equipped to fight. And so even though Egypt came out to destroy them, Egypt wound up supplying them for the battle that was next. And now not only did they find out that God had been a deliverer, now they found out that God has been a provider. Now they're going to find out that God is also a general in the time of war. And they go out and they do battle and they discover through prayer and through seeking God's face that they can win their battles. See, they're in the wilderness. But even though they're in the wilderness, even though they've seen these great miracles, they still have Egypt in them. Even though when you, 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 you think all this stuff they just saw, they should be right. They should be ready. But Egypt is still in them. And so God is still taking them through this process. And you know the story of the Exodus, how eventually uh, they get sent spies into the promised land and, and 10 out of the 12 spies fold. They said, no, we can't do it. Only two of them said, yes, we can. So y'all thought Obama created that. <laughs> y'all y'all going to get that later. Y'all going to get that later. <laughs> two of them said, yes, we can, right? And they, and they stood. But see, Egypt was still in them. And then for the next 40 years, they had to have Egypt purged. They had to have Egypt purged. And so now we come to this time in Deuteronomy where God is telling them, now you're getting ready to come out of the wilderness. And see, church, this is where so many of us misses it. See, crossing Jordan is a choice. Crossing Jordan is a choice. You, you remember Reuben, he didn't cross. Crossing Jordan is a choice. And, and when you cross Jordan, the first thing we know, they said the manna stopped. But God had made other provision. And now he's telling them, now that you come across Jordan, guys, now that you've made the decision to step into maturity, now your worship has to mature as well. And the first level of getting this maturity right is we need to get rid of all those, those lingering attributes of Egypt. When you come in to worship the Lord, what do you bring with you? What vestiges of your old life are you bringing with you? That is why we have to begin, guys, with that, 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 that getting naked process. I have to go before God and strip myself of the stuff of the world. I have to go by and examine myself. I need to go down and cut down those asterisk poles. I need to crush those altars. And I don't need to just push them aside. I need to destroy them. And then when I bring myself into God's presence, I'm not coming like they do in the world. I don't want to come like they did in the world. I don't want to come like I used to in the world. I want to come to God completely and utterly. I want to bring myself to God the way he said. So I know the only way I'm going to get into the, to, to God's presence is through the blood. I got to come under the blood fresh every time. It's not a one-time thing. It's not something I did back then. I come under the blood. I come under that dominion of God. And I come to worship God in his place of power where his name is recognized. We pray all the time in the name of Jesus. And I think somebody think that's just another way of saying amen. But we're talking about under the authority of Jesus. And when I come in and worship, I want to worship in the name of God. I want to worship in his place of dominion where I have surrendered myself, where I have submitted myself. And I come and say, Lord... Here I am. And when I worship, just like in prayer, I'm not trying to change God's mind. I'm not trying to change God's mind. I'm trying to come in alignment with his will. Remember when Jesus said to the, the disciples, said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. One of the first lines of instruction we gave him is to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is that any different in worship? Why is that any different than anything else we do? God is calling you and I to be submitted and surrendered to him. See, that's the big question. Will we surrender ourselves to God? Because our worship is so personal that we begin to own it and we can begin to feel like we can do it this way or do it that way. But we need to come to God the way he wants us to come to him. When you come to God and say, okay, Lord, what do you want from me? It's, it's like I'm saying, I'm, I'm loving my wife. We talk about that. How many of you guys remember the book, The Five Love Languages? And one of the big mistakes that book points out is what? That we have a tendency to love people according to our own love language, not according to theirs. Now, my wife and I are different in this. 
when it comes to our love language, I'm a person, I, I love physical touch and I love time together, words of affirmation. My wife's primary love language is acts of service. So I know when she wants to say she loves me, she does something for me. I'd be like, come sit down and talk to me, woman. She's like, let me get you a cup of coffee. Let me do that. I'm like, <laughs> because that's our love language. And, and we do this with God. We come to God and we're gonna, we'll do things with God the way we want to. And, and, and I remember, let me just share just a quick anecdotal point with you, and, and we won't be long on this. My oldest son, Ray, when he was like four or five, maybe younger, uh, it was Father's Day. And he wanted to tell me that he loved me. So he gave me a rock. <laughs> but that wasn't even the best part. The best part was my rock. <laughs> but he drew a little picture and wrote a little thing on it and taped it to the rock. Said, you know, I, I wanted to get you something, but all I have is this rock. So I gave you this rock. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> and you know where that rock is right now? It's at home on my window in my bedroom. You see, even though we come to God and we give him our gifts in our immaturity, God still accepts them. But you know, my son comes into my life today and he has a gift. And he says, Dad, I noticed the sprinklers in the yard need to be redone. He goes, I'm gonna take care of that for you. And he comes in and he goes, mom wants the, the, the grass redone, so I'm gonna recurb the grass. And I noticed, dad, that your Wi-Fi system is just weak. <laughs> and all of a sudden he's got these little white boxes all over the house and, <laughs> and now I can actually use my phone in the bedroom. What am I trying to say is that his gifts, his acts of worship mature. You see, and that's what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to mature in our worship. It's not about singing a song. I love the worship it. I love the excitement of it. I love the thrill, but if that's all you got. That's what they do in the world. See, that's what worship looks like in the world. If it's just about the beat and the rhythm, then that's what they do in the world. If it's just about whether somebody can make you feel good. Guys, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. I grew up in disco. I know what beat feels like. <laughs> and a good DJ would make you feel something even when you didn't want to. <laughs> so it's not about the beat and the rhythm. See, that's, that's basic. That's carnal. God wants to take you beyond that. He wants to take you beyond that to where when you are crying out to God, you are actually talking you having communication with him but see this all begins with an act of the will where are you in this where are you in this this is what we're talking about it's so easy especially in an environment like this where it's so conducive it's so easy to come in and to fall into what we call the flow of worship this is easy and you can come in here you can go through the motions you can go through the streams and raise your hands you can sit down do all those things because we know how to do it but God is looking for worshipers. Someone who's going to really take that time and establish intimacy with him. Am I going to touch God's heart? Am I going to let God touch my heart? And this is how you'll know. If you really worship the Lord, if you really struggle with God, when you're done, you'll walk different. You'll walk different. Your gate will be changed. Your purpose will be established. You have clarity of mind. He, have, he will have removed those things from you that, that cause you to be confused. He'll give you that peace. Brother Glenn was talking about today, that peace. It'll settle in your heart and your spirit. Even in the midst of trouble and trial, you'll have that peace. And somebody will say, well, how are you feeling? I feel good. Why? I don't know. I just worship my God, and all of a sudden, I, 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 I know it's going to be all right. So this morning, the, the challenge to you and to I, to myself, I'm sorry, is that we learn to worship the Lord and we come before him with the idea that God teach me how to worship. Teach me how to give myself to you. Now, I, 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 th there's a thought I want to share with you. And I said there's two foundational positions that we worship God from. One is what we call your then. 
your then. And the other one is from the position of his faithfulness. If you read, especially in the Old Testament, God will constantly tell the nation of Israel, do this because. Do this, but remember, you were a slave in Egypt. Do this because I delivered you. What is he telling them? He's telling them to worship me because of your then. So when you come in here to worship the Lord, part of that experience is what has God done for you? What is your worship attached to? What is, it, what is it growing out of? I'm worshiping God out of my then. I'm worshiping God because what he's delivered me from, what he's brought me through. I'm worshiping God because I remember being a slave in Egypt. And now I can forgive because all has been forgiven of me. And then I worship God out of his faithfulness because of what he said he's going to do. I worship God because of what he's doing right now in my life. And I worship God for what he's promised to do. On one hand, I'm worshiping God for what he's already done in my life, and now I'm worshiping him because of his faithfulness. He's sustaining me, and I'm worshiping God because of what he has promised to do. Even though right now I might be in a very tight spot, even though right now I may be behind the prison doors, I may be closed up in darkness and pain or sickness or loss, even though right now my circumstances are not good at all, but because God is faithful, I can worship looking forward. And I can base that looking forward on what he's already done. Because there was a time yesterday when I was bound. There was a time yesterday when I was locked up behind the prison door. There was a time yesterday when I was facing sickness and sorrow and loss and God delivered me. So out of my then now gives me the birth of my experience to worship him for my future. And so we go on from there. I, I want to finish with this one, one thought. A brother uh, was talking to me yesterday, as I, uh, just a, a Thursday, was getting ready to go, and he mentioned to me this concept of, of moon, of the moon and how it reflects the light of the sun. And I began to think there is an old Jewish uh, teaching that some of the uh, old guys in antiquity used to use to teach their children about God. You see, there is eight phases of the moon. There's eight phases of the moon. And the first one is the new moon. And the new moon is, very, is barely visible. So when you get exposed to God, you see, the people around you might not even see it. They might not even see the work. They may see just a sliver. But see, the, the, the light of that new moon is actually seen by the ambient light around it. From those people, those, those people who are influences in your life, that's what makes that, that new moon visible. But as you go, that moon begins to slide out and the light of the sun, is, that disc becomes more and more visible. Until eventually, about the fifth phase, we have full moon. And at full moon, the full disc of the moon is now visible. Why? Not because it's generating any light of its own, but because it's reflecting the light of the sun. That fifth phase talks about grace. And then we move on to that sixth phase. And that's when it begins to wane. Six always reminds you of the man. It's the number of man. And see, and this is where we can get in trouble even with our worship. Because if we're not careful, we'll take that full light and we'll begin to pollute it with ourself, with our flesh. And that light can be dimmed. But well, that's okay. Stay in his presence because eight is the number of new beginning. Amen. Hallelujah. And the light starts all over again. And so this is what I want to encourage you with today. As you think about your life going forward, remember where God brought you from. Remember your experience in Egypt. Remember what it was like to be in bondage to the world. But then I want you to focus that through the lens of my deliverance. Think about how God brought you through. And yes, remember those times in the wilderness where you were stumbling in your faith, where you were learning what it meant to walk with God. You had some victories, but you had some setbacks, but God never left you. And now you come to that place of decision and you see it over and over again in the New Testament. The apostle is good at saying, you ought to be here by now. 
You ought to be. I wanted to give you this, but I couldn't because you still need spiritual milk. He's saying, but you ought to be here now. And the Spirit of God is saying to us, now it's time to make that decision to cross over Jordan into spiritual maturity. And we do that for two reasons. One, to be pleasing to him. And the second one is because the world around us needs to see him in us. They need to see us living governed by God. Because the world is offering them no hope, no promises. It's just offering them lies that will lead to their defeat. And we cannot afford to do nothing. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray over that word. Let's pray over that word. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come, we long to be true worshipers, Lord God. And Lord, with all the blessings you've given us, we pray that you help our eyes to be open, that we don't fall into the trappings of the stuff. But Lord, instead our hearts remain pure before you. That even as you brought our bodies out of the wilderness, you brought our bodies out of Egypt, Lord, we pray bring our minds out of Egypt. Lord, bring our minds out of Egypt, purify us through that washing, through the water of your word. Lord, bring us into new traditions. Help us, Lord, to be just ruthless, Father, in the destruction of those old things in our lives. Help us not to, to look at it fondly, but help us to cut it down, to burn it, to crush it, to grind it to nothingness. And then, Lord, to establish ourselves in you in new patterns of life, and new patterns of living, and new patterns of worship. That as we bring ourselves to you, Father, we can truly give ourselves to you in intimacy. And that there would be no hindrances, no facades. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, I want to pray for the souls of your people. Lord, you know who's here in this room today. You know who's listening online. Lord, you know all these things, and nothing's hidden from you, as Brother said earlier, Lord. So I pray, Father, touch your people. If there are those even here this morning, Lord God, who are still holding on to the trappings of Egypt, who are still holding on to the fondness of the wilderness, Lord God, and Lord, they, are being, they can hear that challenge today that they need to come across into Jordan, Lord. I pray, Lord, give them that touch. Draw them out of that darkness and that bondage that would hold them otherwise, Lord God. Loose them in the name of Jesus. And Father, there be those who don't know you at all. Uh, they're still in Egypt, God. They haven't come out yet. Father, I pray they would hear the clarion call of your spirit and let them follow you out. Let them come out alive, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Bring them out and bring them unto yourself. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, blessed be the name of the Lord, Brother Gate. Amen. You know, I, I was, uh, as I turned this back over to Pastor. I was thinking this morning about Lazarus. If you remember Lazarus, he was dead. But if you can imagine being Lazarus in the tomb, behind the stone, wrapped up in, in all the burial clothes, but there's a voice that rings out. There's a voice that cried through the stone, through the darkness, through the burial cloth, into the chambers of death, and called him by name, Lazarus. And Lazarus stirred. And that voice said, come forth. Now you can imagine Lazarus bringing his little tied up self out the tomb. <laughs> See, and that's where a lot of us can be, guys. We've answered the call of God. We've hopped our little dead bodies out of the tomb. But we're still bound. See, and that's where you come in. Because Jesus didn't turn and said, go loose him. Go loose him. And that's where we come in. We loose each other from the bondages of death. Amen. 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 God bless you, brother. Brother, thank you. Pastor Ray, thank you very much. That was encouraging, wasn't it? Amen. Good, good, good word. You know, what we want to do right now is we want to prepare a love offering for Pastor Ray Ellis. You know, if you're making a check out, make it out to Life Church of Orange, and then we're going to um, give him one uh, check. But, you know, I want to read to you here from 1 Corinthians 9, 11. And it, it simply says this. He says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? 
And, and you know, that, that should be clear to us. We've reaped today. We, what's, what's been sown into us is spirit, something spiritual, something that if you heard what, uh, what God was saying uh, by his spirit through his servant, there's great life there, great maturity, great increase. And, and that today, you know, Pastor Glenn prayed it earlier in pre-service prayer about today is a day like no other. And, and that today was ordained by God. So you were here ordained by God to be here to hear this message. The spirit of God wanted you to hear this today for your blessing, for your increase, for your maturity to, to that, that because this is important to the Lord that he wanted to make sure that you were here today. And that's a blessed thing. So you've received today something spiritual that's been sown in you. Can we not also share uh, and, and bless out of our material gifts to bless the man of God? Amen. So ushers, can I have you come down here and uh, just receive um, what you've had a chance to prepare? Praise God. Amen. Yes, um, and, and no, and no, you can't. No. Oh, we, we don't have it set up. Somebody was asking a question, uh, if you can give on the app. You can't right now. We have to set that up uh, for special offerings. The only, well, the only way that you could do that, yeah, but it would be confused with the other offering for the day. So, yeah, okay, tell you what, and this is going to be a little bit of work, but you're going to have to come and let me know, um, just because we don't have that set up that way. You would have to communicate with me and let me know uh, so we could uh, make sure that goes towards Pastor Ray Ellis. Uh, amen. We'll work it all out. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we, we do good, right? Praise God. Thank you for that, church. Thank you for uh, sharing and giving in that. Uh, and I know the Lord will increase and bless you. But what we're, uh, we're going to do, as we always do, we're going to receive uh, communion at this time. You know, and so um, I believe the ushers have come around and, and served you the elements. If you have not, just raise your hand and we'll make sure that comes to you. But the Bible tells us, uh, interestingly, I didn't know what Pastor Ray was going to talk about today. So, um, but the Bible does tell us that before we followed Christ, we were all children of wrath spiritually it was a hopeless place ephesians 2 3 through 5 says among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we were by nature children of wrath just as the others but god who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses trespasses made us alive together with christ by grace you have been saved. See, the word of God tells us be, because we were all under the judgment of God and we were rightfully condemned in our sins prior to Christ's coming. But what the Lord did was he took upon himself in his very own body the sins of all mankind so that all who call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. He lived the life that we could never live and he died the death that we should have all died. And he arose alive from death as confirmation of resurrection life for us. He is the bread of life providing everything that we need. John 6.35 says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And he's speaking of this both in, in, in spiritual terms. So Jesus, he drank the cup of God's wrath in our place, and in exchange, we will drink the cup of God's grace, the new covenant in his blood, and God's grace, his unmerited favor, his empowerment will be bestowed upon us forever. Let me read Luke 22. Go ahead and prepare the elements there if you have them. We do this all by faith. There's nothing magical about the elements, but this is a moment. It's a holy moment. 
It's a worshipful moment, but it's a moment that we, an intimate moment as well. And we remember what Jesus has done for us. Luke 22, verse 19, it says, He took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. Would you break and eat? Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Go ahead and take the cup and drink. And Lord, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood that you've done this for us. And Jesus, we do this so that we do not forget. We do this to remember. We do this because you said as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we will not forget what a great sacrifice you did out of love for us because of your great love. As I was saying earlier at the beginning of the service, Lord God, we love you because you first loved us and you showed it to us. You demonstrated it on the cross and what you suffered. But Lord God, we worship you and enjoy you because you rose again. You have ascended on high and one day you are returning and we look forward with great joy, great anticipation to your returning. Come Lord Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Well, God bless you all, church. God bless you and thank you for being here today with us in God's house. And uh, praise God that we had uh, a Pastor Ray Ellis with us here to encourage you. I believe that you were encouraged, but I hope that you found great encouragement in today's message. And uh, just a reminder. Um, we have concluded our Thursday night Bible study. So last Thursday night was our last Bible study. So we're, we've stopped doing that on Thursday nights. We're going to be, we'll let you know about doing something uh, later on here in the future. But um, uh, we won't be having a Thursday night online service. Uh, we'll be taking a little bit of uh, it's a change of season. Change of season is good. So Becky, going to lead us out, close us here this morning. Take it away. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing that song that we did last week. It's going to be awesome. We, we got to give it the same energy, though. Re, you all ready for this? I saw you guys you do gotta, it last week. You got to worship the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to shout for joy. We're going to enter his gates with thanksgiving. Here we go.
he's with me Never does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands He is so good to me Never does a day go by without him by my side He never walks away He's with me Never does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands He is so good to me Always For the Lord He's good Always Always and forever Come on, never does a day Never does a day go by Without Him by my side He never walks away He's with me Never does a moment pass That I'm not in His hands He is so good to me Never does a day go by without him by my side. He never walks away. He's with me. Never does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands. Come on. He is so good to me. Always. For the Lord, he's good. Always. Always. Somebody tell them you are a good God. Thank you, Lord. Well, remember, have a good week, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday, Mother's Day. And uh, God bless you. We do not have a Bible study this Thursday, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. God bless. Bye. <laughs>